Hi, Miss Nikki here. Welcome to Chapter 23, Respiratory System. This is Part 1. So in Part 1, we're really going to focus on more of the anatomy. We're going to run through all these structures. We'll talk about how the respiratory system is organized structurally. So we're going to go through all of these upper respiratory structures like the nasal cavity and the pharynx and the larynx. And then we're going to move to the lower respiratory tract and we're going to talk about the trachea and the bronchi and the bronchioles. Over here on the functional organizational chart, they're talking more about how are we exchanging gases. So we're going to come back and we're going to talk about these alveoli um, and we're going to discuss exactly what's happening during the oxygen and CO2 exchange. So the term respiration is gas exchange, right? We're exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide and cells need that oxygen in order to aerobically produce ATP. Remember that's happening in the mitochondria, right? Cellular respiration, we could do the whole equation, right? I'm not gonna balance it, I'll just write it out for you. So we're kind of focused here on the oxygen part. When we get to digestion, we'll focus on the sugars, right? The glucose. So cells need that oxygen. And we're exchanging gases in the pulmonary circulation. So you're gonna kind of go back and think about the cardiovascular system, right? So we're moving blood through the lungs, we're dropping off CO2 at the pulmonary capillaries and we're picking up oxygen, pushing that back to the heart, right? The left side of the heart. And then we're pumping that out to the body. And when we get out to the body, we're delivering that oxygen to the tissues. General functions of the respiratory system, hopefully we can go through these, they make sense to us. It is a passageway for air, so exchanging air between the atmosphere and those alveoli sacs. The site of gas exchange that's happening at the alveoli. Detection of odors, you might remember the olfactory cranial nerve, number one, we have olfactory receptors, they're in the superior portion of the nasal cavity, and they're gonna help us detect odors. And then we also have sound production. This is probably one that we don't think about. This is happening in the larynx. We're gonna look at vocal cords and vocal folds and the glottis or the opening. Those cord, vocal cords are gonna vibrate and that's what produces sound. If we look at the upper respiratory tract, here's a list of the structures, the nose, the nasal cavity, the pharynx, and the larynx. Lower respiratory tract, you can see trachea, bronchi, this would be right and left bronchus, bronchioles, those are the branches, alveolar ducts, and alveoli. For the functional zone, we're either in a conducting zone where we're transporting the air. So the tube system that's bringing the air to the alveoli. So you see it says nose to terminal bronchioles. The respiratory zone is where we're actually doing gas exchange. And this is happening in the respiratory bronchioles, which lead to the alveolar ducts, which actually lead to the alveoli. So again, Functional organization, more about the gas exchange. Structural, which structures make up which track. So here they're talking about the respiratory mucosa. So there's a mucous membrane. This is the lining of the respiratory system. There's epithelium and then there's underlying connective tissue. So I put an image here that we can see the mucus lining and we can see the different types of epithelia. So we see some of the cells are ciliated, some of them are goblet cells, and goblet cells are going to help produce uh, mucin, mucus. And then we're gonna have some progenitor cells that are gonna make more of these cells. We also have some cells that have channels on them, and we'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide. So if you have this epithelial lining, right, this would be the lumen or the opening. You're gonna have epithelium, then you're gonna have connective tissue, then we're gonna see muscle, and then we're gonna see some sort of fibrous or adventitia, right, to have structure to the overall tube system, right? So we're also gonna have uh, defense against microbes. So this mucous membrane is going to have bacterial enzymes, basically, um, they can break down the cell wall of a pathogen. In that case, I'm talking about bacteria, right? Uh, defensins, 
if you remember kind of when we talked about uh, complement protein, uh, defensins can actually either stop the pathogen from invading or they can break the cell wall of the pathogen. Um, IgA, this uh, immunoglobulin A, this is also secreted by the mucous membrane and it basically helps stop infection. So it stops uh, pathogens from being able to infect the epithelial lining. So lots of uh, defense mechanisms here. So in cystic fibrosis, there are defective chloride channels. So the cl chloride ion can't be pumped out of the epithelial cell lining. And without this chloride, the mucus becomes really thick. And that causes the cilia not to be able to move. So the mucus is just stuck in the respiratory tract and it's blocking the flow of air. And you can imagine how a buildup of mucus can increase in pulmonary infections, right? This can also happen in the ducts of the pancreas, in salivary glands. And basically, if you have a backup of digestive enzymes, this can actually destroy the pancreas. So kind of have some sort of autolysis effect here. We haven't really talked about the pancreas and we haven't talked about the digestive enzymes uh, enough yet. We're going to talk about them again in digestion. So basically, if you have extra thick mucus due to a defective chloride channel, you're going to have more mucus blocking the respiratory tract and increased infections. So the first structure that air should enter would be the nose. Your nostrils are called nares or nares. This is made up of dense, irregular connective tissue. If you remember the dense, irregular, you have fibers running every which direction, right? So it gave you great flexibility. Um, you're also going to have bone here. Remember, we have nasal bones at the bridge of the nose. We're going to see hyaline cartilage and skin. We're not going to name the different cartilages of the nose. It's fine. Nice image here. You can see in blue, we have the nasal cavity. You can see the pharynx. We're going to talk about this in just a second. And then they're showing you the different cartilages and dense and regular connective tissue. And then we have our nostril right there. Hopefully we remember the nasal conchi. There's three bones or bony projections. This one was a facial bone. These two were part of the ethmoid, if you remember. Um, these are going to help move air as it's inhaled into the nasal cavity. Parts of the nasal cavity, we have the nasal vestibule. This is just inside the nostrils. We also have particle trapping hairs, vibrissae. We have the olfactory region, which is going to have the olfactory nerve receptors for odor detection. And then we're going to have the respiratory region. This is that pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, extensive vascular network. We're going to kind of warm the air as it enters the nasal cavity. Nosebleeds are common because of this extensive vascularity. I like this image because it kind of color codes everything for you. You can see the nasal cavity. The majority of it is in blue. You can see the olfactory region. They're trying to show you the cribriform plate here of the ethmoid bone. If you remember, the olfactory bulb sits right here. They're showing you the nasal vestibule at the entrance uh, where the nostril is located. Then they're showing you a few of the bones here. You can see superior would be here, middle here, inferior here. I like this image because you can kind of see the little inferior nasal conchi, little curly cues as I call them. So those are the inferior. The middle is right here and then the superior is here. Remember this is that perpendicular plate that meets the vomer and forms this nasal septum or division between the right and left. Nasal lacrimal ducts. So your lacrimal secretions from your eye drain to the nasal cavity. So the nasal cavity conditions the air, it warms it, it cleans it, humidifies it. The air is warmed by those extensive blood vessels. The mucus is going to trap any pathogen, microbe. Cilia is going to sweep the mucus towards the pharynx to be swallowed. Air turbulence created by the conchi enhances all of these processes. Paranasal sinus, we're not going to go through all of the sinuses. Um, we're not going to name them, but I just wanted to show you where they are located. 
So you can see here frontal sinus, maxillary sinus, and we do have some behind the eye. So if you have any sort of sinus issues and you feel that pressure behind your eye, it's probably due to those ethmoidal and sphenoidal uh, sinuses. The mucus from these sinuses can be swept into the pharynx and swallowed. The pharynx is broken into three distinct structures, right? We always like to take these tube structures and break them into subparts. So nasopharynx, this is behind the nasal cavity. The oropharynx behind the mouth or the oral cavity. And laryngeopharynx or laryngeopharynx, either way, behind the larynx. So the nasopharynx, it's an air passageway, not for food. It connects the middle ear, the auditory tube, or what we used to call a eustachian tube, and there are tonsils. We're going to see the pharyngeal tonsil. This is sometimes called adenoid. Oropharynx, this is that middle section. It's posterior to the oral cavity. It is a passageway for both food and air, and again, we have tonsils. This time we have two, the palatine tonsil and the lingual tonsil. A laryngeopharynx, it's inferior, narrow region, posterior to the larynx, passageway for both food and air. So here, this image, you can see nasal cavity here. This part right here would be the nasopharynx. You can see the oral cavity, so this section would be the oropharynx. You can see the larynx here, so this section would be the laryngeopharynx. Again, you can see tonsils. So pharyngeal tonsils would be up here. I like that they're showing you the auditory tube or eustachian tube. So drainage from your inner ear hits the nasopharynx, and then you would swallow that down the esophagus. Um, you don't see all of the tonsils, but they're showing you some here. You have palatine tonsils and you have lingual tonsils. We'll look at those on the models in class. So the larynx, is the airway between the laryngopharynx and the trachea. This is where sound is produced. So those vocal folds are gonna vibrate. We're gonna see air move through the larynx. Um, we're going to see the epiglottis cover the opening during swallowing to stop us from putting food or any other ingested material other than air into the respiratory tract. A few things to see. One here, this is the uvula. The uvula, when you swallow, is going to stop food from being pushed into the nasopharynx. So remember, nasopharynx should be air only. Here we have the epiglottis. The epiglottis is supposed to come down and close off the larynx so that you don't push food into your airway. Food should go oropharynx, laryngeopharynx, and then be pushed esophagus to the stomach. I wanted to show you all of the cartilages and membranes here, um, lots of ligaments. Here's your hyoid. We're not gonna go through all of these cartilage names. I just want you to realize we have cartilage that makes up the larynx. And then when we come and look at the trachea, we're gonna see cartilage again. So this cartilage is there to keep this pathway open, right? We need air. We don't want this pathway to collapse, this tube to collapse. So we have cartilage. Now, when we look at voice production, we're gonna mention true vocal cords and then false vocal cords. They want you to realize that vocal cords are going to produce sound. These vestibular folds play no role in sound production. They're there just to protect the vocal cords. These are both gonna be covered in mucosa, and we're gonna see an area called the glottis, which includes both the vocal folds and the opening. So this right here is the opening. image you can see the strips here kind of whitish in color those are the vocal folds vocal true vocal cords and then we have the vestibular folds that would be these protective structures 
the epiglottis, it doesn't really look as large as it is here. And it's in the other image, it kind of is a little bit enlarged. So you can see this flap would come down and close over this entryway. Um, again, we have this opening and it's a little technical. Um, we used to call the glottis the opening. But technically, the glottis is where we have sound production. So they include both the vocal folds and this structure, rima glottidis. And these two together make up the glottis. But used to be, we would just say the glottis is the opening. Now we move on to lower respiratory tract. So now we're talking about the conducting pathways, the tubes that are bringing the air to the alveoli. So we're gonna talk about trachea, right and left bronchus, bronchioles, terminal bronchioles. Then we're gonna look at the structures that are involved just in gas exchange. Now we're at respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and those alveoli themselves. So the trachea are windpipes, open tube, connecting the larynx to the main bronchi. You're gonna see lots of tracheal cartilage. They're the C-shaped rings. The trachea needs to always be open. We always need air because we always need oxygen because we need to do cellular respiration because we need to make ATP, right? I wanted to show you this tracheal muscle um, it connects the open ends of the C-shaped cartilage, and it allows you, when you're swallowing something, the food can push into the open space of the trachea. Um, it would not be good if, the, if you're blocking your airway, right? So it gives you a little bit of wiggle room. So we're gonna look at this trachealis muscle, and this is what's also contracting in order for you to cough. Um, we're also gonna see that there's an end of the trachea. There's lots of receptors here, this uh, carina, and this will initiate a cough reflex if there's any sort of irritant. Basically, if anything touches this structure, it's going to set off these sensory receptors and you're going to have violent coughing. Here you can see the larynx and then the trachea. Here's that end point we were talking about. And then here is the trachealis muscle. So if your esophagus is here and you're swallowing something that opens the esophagus, you can push this trachealis muscle and that esophagus can expand into this open space or this lumen. This is also how choking can occur, right? If you, are, if you push this trachealis muscle to its limit and you limit the amount of air that can move through that trachea, you're not gonna be able to exchange gas efficiently, right? So this is the choking hazard. Then we can see here the right main bronchus and the left main bronchus. Looking at the histology of the trachea, we can see this mucosal layer and epithelium, right? Then we know we have connective tissue. We always have connective tissue underneath epithelium because this is vascular, right? And we're gonna have this submucosal layer. It is also connective tissue, but we're also gonna see blood vessels and nerves and mucous glands and serous glands and lymphatic tissue running through this submucosal layer. We're also gonna see cartilage. What would be the next layer would be cartilage here in the trachea. And then we're gonna have this elastic connective tissue on the outside. So in other parts of the respiratory system and digestive system, you're gonna see muscle here. When we get to the bronchioles, instead of cartilage, we're gonna see muscle. Bronchial tree, this is the highly branched air passageways. So we know we come down the trachea, we go to the right and the left bronchus, and these are gonna narrow and continue to narrow until we get out to the smallest bronchioles. So main bronchi, um, bronchus, each bronchus is going to enter the lung on the medial side. We're going to see an image in just a second. So basically, if your lung is here and here on this medial side is where we're going to have blood vessels entering. It's where we're going to see the bronchus entering. So it all enters through this section. The bronchial tree continues. So we have our trachea, we have our right, and we have our left bronchus. 
right? So I'm going to write bronchi, trachea. All they're saying is you have secondary branches and tertiary branches. So you're going to have a branch off of here, and then you're going to have a branch off of here. So we usually say trachea, then we're going to say right and left bronchus. Then we're going to go directly to bronchioles. So we don't say tertiary bronchial, secondary bronch. We're just going to say trachea, right and left bronchus, and then we're going to get here to bronchioles. Then you're going to have a terminal bronchial. From a terminal bronchial, you're going to have a respiratory bronchial, and then you'll eventually have the alveol. I think this is a nice image. They're showing you the larynx leading to the trachea, leading to the right and the left bronchus. And then we have all of this branching until we get to these terminal ends down here. And this is where we're going to see our alveoli, right? So the actual gas exchange structures. So basically kind of what they're trying to point out here is all of this is delivering the air. This is where we're actually going to have gas exchange. I think on the previous slide it also mentioned the fact that the right bronchus is a little bit more straight. So if you swallow something, it almost always likes to go to the right side because the left side kind of takes this uh, detour a little bit because the heart is here. So your left bronchus kind of goes at more of an angle than your right. So bronchitis here. We can see the itis, hopefully by now we know that's inflammation and we're talking about the bronchi. It's usually some sort of infection, bacterial, viral. It can also be due to some sort of inhaled chemical or irritant. So acute would mean now, right, short term. And then we have this chronic or long-term exposure, coughing lasting for several months. The problem is that a chronic bronchitis can actually lead to permanent changes within the histology or the cells of the bronchi. This can increase the likelihood of future bacterial infections. So bronchial tree, we have the main bronchi. They're going to have rings of hyaline cartilage to keep them open. We're going to have wall support, right? We're going to have bronchioles with no cartilage, and we're going to see muscle. So remember we said trachea has cartilage, and then we said bronchi have cartilage. But once we get to the ends, these little guys, we're at the bronchioles, no cartilage, now we're talking about muscle. And if we have muscle, it's going to be able to do constriction or dilation. We saw this with the smooth muscle of the cardiovascular system, right? So. Um, if we want to do vasoconstriction, that means less air is moving through the bronchial tree. If we relax the muscle and we do bronchial dilation, then we have more air moving through. You could think about something like asthma. So this is where you have extreme bronchial constriction, causes wheezing and coughing and shortness of breath and excess mucus. Um, it can be an immune response, right? Uh, treatments, we can give you inhaled steroid or inhaler. Uh, bronchial dilators, we're trying to open up, so open up airway. Um, why is this a problem? Uh, if you don't open up the airway, you don't have enough oxygen, you can't make enough ATP, right? Not good for your brain, not good for your muscles, right? So now we move on to the respiratory bronchioles. And we're going to see that from the terminal, bronchial, we are leading to the respiratory bronchial. Those are going to subdivide into the alveolar ducts. Alveolar ducts are going to lead to the alveolar sacs, which are clusters of alveoli. We're going to see that these respiratory bronchioles are lined with epithelium. It's specifically simple squamous epithelium at the alveoli and alveolar ducts. This, remember, if you remember simple squamous epithelium, we said was really good at diffusion. And the example we gave was in the lungs, and we talked about oxygen and CO2 back in the first anatomy, right? So simple squamous is really good at exchanging non-charged molecules. 
So here we have the bronchiole. Then they show you that this is a terminal bronchiole. And then we see the respiratory bronchial off of the terminal bronchial. There could be another here, right? There could be another here. And then we see off of the respiratory bronchial, we have the alveolar ducts. And alveolar ducts lead to alveoli. This whole thing is called an alveolar sac. So hopefully we remember something about pulmonary capillary beds, right? When we were following our blood flow, right, we were talking about pulmonary arteries. Pulmonary arteries went to pulmonary arterioles. Pulmonary arterioles went to pulmonary capillaries. And this is the site of gas exchange. This is where we are dropping off CO2 and we are picking up oxygen. It's amazing to me that each lung contains upwards of 400 million alveoli each lung, so 800 million total. We're gonna look at the cell types of the alveolar wall. So there's type one cells. This is the majority of the alveolar surface. We're gonna see the alveolar type two cells, and these produce a secretion called surfactant. It's gonna coat the inside, alveolus is one singular, and it stops the collapse. The next image will make it a little bit better. Alveolar macrophages. So we have leukocytes, macrophages, that are able to engulf microorganisms and they can be fixed or they can be freely moving through the lung tissue, through these alveolar um, sacs. So we talked about all the antimicrobial uh, proteins and enzymes. We talked about the fact that we've got um, coarse hairs in our nasal cavity. We've got this mucous membrane. We've got tonsils to trap any particles. Now we're talking about once we get through all of those structures and we're actually in the alveolar sac, we also have macrophages that are wandering to pick up any pathogens that might have made it through. So first let's look at the cell types. Here's the type 1. So they're showing you all of these type 1 cells. Then they're showing you the type 2 cells. So the type 2 cells are going to make surfactant. So we'll come back and look at this in a second. The type 1 cells are actually doing gas exchange. This is where we're dropping off CO2 and we're picking up oxygen. They took this section and they blew it up so that you could see the membrane of the type 1 cell butts up right next to the capillary membrane. And this is where we are exchanging gases. If this was more than one layer, if the uh, type 1 cell here folded on itself, that would be bad. You'd have to have to, two layers to get through. So that's where the surfactant comes in. So there are water molecules in the air that we breathe, right? We've talked about humidity, water vapor. So we know that when we're breathing in, we're not only getting oxygen, but there's water in the air in gas form, right? When we get to our lungs here, we can see these little water molecules are sitting on the inside of the alveoli. The surfactant binds and stops the water from being attracted to each other. Water likes um, not only to stick to surfaces, but likes to stick to itself, right? So cohesion and adhesion. We do not want this alveoli to collapse. We would not be able to do gas exchange. So you have to be producing enough surfactant to keep that alveoli open. In this case, it's just one, so it's alveolus. So what is pneumonia? I'm sure we've all heard somebody talking about having pneumonia. It is an infection of the lung. The alveoli are filling with fluid. Um, it could also be uh, pus, so white blood cells breaking down pathogens. It can be something exuded from the um, bacteria itself. Usually it's a bacterial, can be viral infection. It's going to cause cough, fever, difficulty breathing, uh, chest pain, increased heart rate. You can also have milder symptoms, so sometimes they'll call it walking pneumonia. You're well enough to be walking around, but you still have fluid filling those alveoli. You could imagine how if you have fluid in the actual alveoli sacs, in those alveolar one cells, you're not going to be able to efficiently exchange gases.
So the lungs are in the thoracic cavity. They're on either side of the mediastinum. We're going to see the bronchial tree and all the respiratory portions. Each lung has a base which sits on top of the diaphragm and it has a point at the top which is the apex. Lung surfaces, you're going to have the coastal surface where the ribs are going to sit. You're going to have a medial stinal surface adjacent to the mediastinum, that's the middle portion, right? And you're going to have the surface that actually touches the diaphragm. We're also going to see the hilium. This is a region on the lungs, medial stinal side, and this is where we're going to see the bronchi enter, the pulmonary vessels, the nerves, the lymphatic pass through this area. So if we have our lungs here, sorry, terrible drawing, right? This is the hilium where we're actually going to see the right and left bronchus enter. So you can see in this image, they're trying to show you the mediastinum. They're showing you the apex or the point. They're showing you the base and it would be sitting on the diaphragm. Here you can see a little bit better. Um, you can see the lungs on the surface, the outer surface. You can see the diaphragm coming up and down. Remember diaphragm is kind of like an umbrella. So the base sits on the diaphragm. Here we can see the lungs. There are three lobes to the right side and there's only two on the left side. This is a nice image of the root, the root, the helium, where all of these, the bronchus, the arteries, the veins, the lymphatic, all make their way into the lungs. The right lung is larger and wider. The left lung is smaller and it has this cardiac notch. So research has shown that there's a direct link between smoking and lung cancer. So smoking can cause lots of respiratory changes. So you can have chronic respiratory infections. Um, when we talked about chronic bronchitis, we said it can change the tissue, right? Same thing with smoking. You can have cellular and genetic changes. You can have emphysema where the alveoli are damaged. You can't exchange gas as efficiently. It can lead to cancer, stomach ulcers, uh, plaque buildup, right, hardening of the arteries, uh, low birth weight in pregnant women, uh, poor delivery of oxygen and nutrients to all systemic tissues, so that would cause low oxygen levels, right, um, can cause extreme bronchial constriction, uh, buildup or in inflammation, buildup of mucus in the uh, bronchioles. So, all of these uh, bullet points here, you could look up journal articles where research has shown that smoking can induce or increase the chances of all of these factors. So smoking causes about 85% of all lung cancer. It's highly aggressive um, malignancy, meaning it usually moves. Uh, so from the original position in the respiratory system, that cancerous tumor, can move through the lymphatics, right, through the lymph nodes, and then through the lymphatics, it could make its way to other tissues. So that's what malignancy means, right? It's spreading to other tissues. Um, symptoms include chronic cough, coughing up blood, excess pulmonary mucus, and increased pulmonary infections. Sorry, the word dropped off. The reason it's usually fatal is that by the time you have these symptoms, it has progressed. Uh, later stage cancer, harder to treat, um, and again, if it's setting up shop in other tissues within the body, that could cause problems as well. I want to make sure that we look at the blood supply. So there's two types of circulations when we're talking about the lungs. Pulmonary circulation, so this is the blood from the heart, right? So pulmonary circulation, the arteries carry the oxygenated blood to the pulmonary capillaries. When you get to the pulmonary capillaries, you drop off CO2, you pick up oxygen, then the blood enters the pulmonary venules, veins, and returns to the left atrium of the heart. So we've already done pulmonary circulation. Hopefully we understand that pathway and we could go through it again. So you'll need to do that on the models and make sure that if you forgot any of this, that you can go back and identify all those structures. The bronchial circulation, this is the blood that's coming off of the aorta that is actually going to feed the lung tissue. 
So this should be very similar to when we saw the heart. Remember how we had the blood moving through the heart? And then we had the coronary arteries that came off of the aorta to actually feed the cardiac muscle. So same situation here. So bronchial circulation transports oxygenated blood to the tissues. So it's coming directly off of the thoracic aorta and it's gonna feed the tissues of the lungs. So we have bronchial arteries, three or four branches coming off of the descending or thoracic aorta. And then we're gonna have bronchial veins where the drainage from the veins or from the bronchial tissues into the veins. So go back through this slide, make sure that you can follow the pulmonary circulation. We're here in the right atrium through the tricuspid, right ventricle, pulmonary trunk, right and left pulmonary arteries. We're gonna go out to the pulmonary arterioles. We're gonna to get to the pulmonary capillaries. We're gonna drop off CO2. We're gonna pick up oxygen. We're gonna go back the pulmonary venules, and then we're gonna go back the pulmonary veins into the left atrium, and then into the left ventricle, out the aortic valve into the aorta so then behind here is where you'd have the branches for the bronchial arteries. Just want to make sure that we realize that there are lymphatic vessels and nodes located within the lungs connective tissue around the bronchioles and in the pleura. We'll talk about those um, visceral and parietal pleura in just a second. These are important in removing any excess fluid from the lungs and remember that the fluid, that lymph is gonna be filtered through the lymph nodes. So again, we have yet another way to make sure that we're cleaning any pathogens that happen to make it this far. They want you to go back and make connections with the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic with bronchial dilation and bronchial constriction. So does it make sense sympathetic, fight or flight? You need increased oxygen because you need increased ATP to do the fight or flight. So does it make sense that you would want to open, right, open your bronchioles? You want to have bronchial dilation. So the smooth muscle that's uh, in the bronchioles is going to dilate, allow more air to be moving into the lungs. So you can do more gas exchange. Parasympathetic, rest and digest and hopefully we can see we can do some bronchial constriction we don't need to be pushing as much air into the lungs we look at the pleural membranes remember um, visceral and parietal pleura you should have learned these in 201 serous membrane linings they're going to secrete um, kind of a watery serous fluid and that fluid acts as lubrication. So parietal is gonna to touch the cavity wall. Visceral is gonna to actually touch the organ. Each lung is enclosed in separate visceral membrane and this helps limit the spread of infection. The pleural cavity here, remember the lungs are inflating and deflating. So you're gonna have the visceral pleura and you're going to have the parietal pleura and the cavities in the middle. When the lungs are inflating, all they're saying is that the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura are almost going to be touching. So almost touching when the lungs are inflated. This serous fluid is going to cover the surface. It's going to lubricate. It's going to reduce friction. Again, these are constantly inflating and deflating, and then your heart is right there in the middle, right? Remember, your heart also has visceral and parietal pericardium. So pleurisy, this is inflammation of the pleural membranes. This is going to cause pain every time you breathe. It's going to increase the friction. And remember, the whole point of the pleural membranes was to decrease friction. Um, there's also pleural effusion, where you're going to have excess fluid. So remember, you have that visceral parieta, you have the Pleural, per, visceral 
pleura and parietal pleura, and then you have the cavity here. You can imagine if you have excess fluid building up in the cavity that it's putting pressure on these layers and it's putting pressure on your lungs, can cause shortness of breath. And we talked a little bit before when we did the cardiovascular about failure from the left side of the heart can cause a backup of fluid into the lungs. These last couple slides, we're going to talk about pressure differences. I kind of just want to give you an overview before we move into some of the functional um, topics that we're going to talk about in part two. But there's intrapleural pressure. So this is between the visceral and parietal pleura. Then we have intrapulmonary. So this is in the alveoli. So you're going to see that the intrapulmonary pressure in the alveoli of the lungs is greater than the pressure between the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. So this is going to have an outward pull and that's going to cause the lungs to remain inflated. So I know this is kind of a busy slide, but they're showing you the diaphragm, they're showing you the lungs, and they're saying the pressure in the alveoli is greater than the pressure in the visceral and parietal pleura, in that cavity space. So there's this outward pull or outward pressure keeping the lungs expanded. So the inside pressure in the lungs is greater than the pressure in the membranes surrounding the lungs. So since the lungs remain inflated due to the pressure difference, right? We had intrapulmonary at 760 and we had intrapleural at 756 and that kept the lungs inflated. Right, pushing out. So sometimes if air is introduced into the pleural cavity, so here air is introduced, this pressure goes up. So the only thing keeping the lung inflated is the fact that the intrapulmonary pressure is higher. So what happens if your interpleural pressure goes higher? Then you can have collapsed lung. So this can be from external, so a wound to the chest, atmospheric air is now rushing in uh, to the lungs, or you can have something like a trauma car accident where the rib is lacerating the lung internally. Um, you can have an alveoli or alveola, several of them can rupture or one of them can rupture. Um, and once you have that air, you have to remove it. In order for that lung to kind of reinflate, you're going to have to insert a tube into that pleural cavity and you're going to have to remove that air to return those pressures back to their normal, which would keep the lung inflated. Okay, well that was part one. I know a lot of terminology here, um, but I think a lot of it we kind of already know. We've talked about it um, in some way, shape, or form previously. So in part two, we'll get into a little bit more nitty gritty and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.